Lobbying Rules and Regulations. This is hosted by the Sunlight Foundation. It's about an hour and 30 minutes. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Washington's Lobbying Fix, a discussion of the challenges facing lobbying reform and the actions needed to enact real-time lobbying disclosure in Washington. This is an event put together by the Advisory Committee on Transparency, which is a project of the Sunlight Foundation. Uh, and the advisory committee is composed of 18 individuals and organizations, and you can find out more about the group on our website, which is transparencycaucus.org. Just a brief introduction to the advisory committee. Uh, our role is to share ideas with members of the Congressional Transparency Caucus and members of Congress generally, and also to educate policymakers on transparency-related issues, problems, and solutions. I'd also like to, ah, oh, wonderful, I'd also like to thank uh, the co-chairs of the Congressional Transparency Caucus, Representatives Daryl Issa and Mike Quigley for giving us the space and for working so kindly with us to uh, host all of the advisory committee events this year. So this event will have um, a kind of interesting format. We're going to be broken into three parts. The first part uh, will be introductions by each of our distinguished panelists. Uh, the second part will be just a couple of follow-up questions by me. And then finally, we'll go into Q&A from the audience. And uh, our graduate fellow, Melanie, has a microphone that she'll bring around to all of you guys so that C-SPAN, which is recording this event, will be able to hear uh, your insightful and brilliant questions, as well as uh, the folks here up on the panel. So I'm going to start just by introducing the panelists, and uh, then we'll go to opening statements. And we're going to start on my right with Dan Egan. So Dan has covered lobbying, campaign finance, and other aspects of money and politics for The Washington Post since 2009. He was a White House reporter in 2008 and was the Post's lead Justice Department reporter for the first seven years of the Bush administration. He was part of the team that won the Pulitzer Prize for coverage of the domestic response to the 9-11 attacks in 2002 and was part of the Pulitzer finalist entry in 2006 for coverism of terrorism and national security issues. Uh, since I know pretty much everybody in this panel, I have to disclose conflicts of interest. Uh, in this case, I read his stuff all the time and I enjoy it very much. So I apologize for that conflict. Um, next up is Sheila Krumholtz. She is the executive director of the Center for Responsive Politics, which is a nonpartisan, nonprofit research group that attracts money in US politics. She became the executive director in 2006, having, worked, having served for the previous eight years as the center's research director. And of course, she first joined CRP in 1989. And uh, if I recall correctly, in my notes, apparently indicate this. She worked as an assistant editor for the very first edition of Open Secrets. Uh, conflicts here that we sit on a uh, discussion group together and I also admire her work and Sunlight, of course, uh, helps fund uh, Open Secrets, which is the website uh, that they run in terms of making the, the underlying data available to the public. So moving on to my left is Lisa Rosenberg. She is the Sunlight Foundation's government affairs consultant. Um, and of course, since I work at Sunlight and she works at Sunlight, our desks are about 10 feet apart, so there's probably a conflict there as well. Uh, she is employed by Bernstein Strategy Group, and her role is to lobby Congress to make legislative changes to improve transparency in government. She served as an LA for Senator John Kerry, advising him on issues of technology, consumer protection, campaign finance reform, and judicial nominations. And she also served as counsel for the Senate Government Affairs Committee's special, invi uh, special investigation into campaign finance irregularities. So moving on next, we have Paul Miller, who is the chairman and CEO of Miller Wenhold Capital Strategies, uh, LLC, which is a lobbying firm. Although I don't have any particular conflicts with him, I do work uh, with his partner uh, at, the, at the firm, uh, Dave, who, who I know reasonably well. Um, Paul is also a past president of the American League of Lobbyists, and he's the current, he he's the current head, and correct me if I get this wrong, but he's the current head of uh, American League of Lobbyists working group on lobbying reform. Um, and just a little background, the American League of Lobbyists was founded in 19, uh, 1979 and has around 1,000 members. And finally, all the way to my left is Tom Sussman, the Director of Government Affairs Office for the American Bar Association. I served on uh, the ABA's lobbying task force with him for the last 14 months, uh, but I served as a non-voting member, so it was an advisory capacity. Uh, Tom is the co-editor of the ABA's lobbying manual, which is a fantastic read, although it's about this thick. And he has worked as an adjunct professor at American University's Washington College of Law. 
He, I don't know if you still are, but at least at one point you were the chair of the ethics committee for the American League of Lobbyists. I don't know if that's. So as of, oh, <laughs> and uh, prior to joining the ABA, uh, Tom was a partner at the Washington office of Ropes and Gray LLP for 27 years. Even prior to that, if it's possible to believe, and it probably isn't, he served as chief counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee and also worked for the Office of Legal Counsel in the U.S. Department of Justice. I welcome all of our panelists. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so let's start off um, with Gab walking in front of us and uh, Dan, who's going to make a, a short opening statement. And of course, I'd like to remind all of our panelists, uh, when you start speaking, just please hit the, the push button so that the mics work and everybody can hear you. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, I guess my only conflict is, I guess I, perhaps I've made everyone at this table mad at one point or another, I don't know. Um, the, uh, not, not long after I started covering lobbying at the uh, Washington Post, uh, I ran across a fascinating study. It focused on a generous tax break that was championed by multinational corporations who lobbied on the Hill for it. It lasted just a year, uh, cost the federal government about $100 billion. Um, and so this was a perfect uh, little test tube, I guess. The, there were a group of researchers decided to find out how much companies had spent to lobby for the provision. And they made a rather remarkable discovery, I thought, that for every dollar that the major multi, that these major companies spent, about 800 companies spent on lobbying during the relevant year, they gained $220 from the tax break, which I think is a return of something in the range of 22,000 percent, which is pretty good. Um, that turned out to be the first and last time that I've ever been able to write a story that really came close to calculating uh, the actual return on investment, though. Uh, and even then, obviously, it was very imperfect, uh, since most of the companies involved lobbied on many other things that same year, meaning they actually probably made more than 22,000 percent on that particular investment. The reason the story was so rare is pretty simple. We don't have the data. Uh, lobbyists disclose more information than ever. And, uh, but it still frequently falls short of providing a clear view of who is lobbying who, how much they're spending, and what they're getting in return. I'm just a reporter. I don't take sides on what the policy should be. Many lobbyists will tell you the reporting requirements are already a huge burden and too easily gamed by dishonest players at the expense of those who are playing by the rules. But there's also a case to be made that more transparency may actually help the vast majority of lobbyists who are upstanding and honest by taking the mystery out of the equation, which provides a lot of fodder for uh, suspicions and grand conspiracy theories. One, uh, I guess one thought I would just leave before I end here is the, uh, that one inspiration could be the Foreign Agents Registration Act, which many people may be familiar with, FARA, which is overseen by the Justice Department and has been in place for about 80, 80 years plus, I think. Um, you will find detailed reports about who meets with whom, exactly how much money is changing hands, what kind of work the lobbying or media relations firm is doing for its client, and so on. So it's possible that FARA could provide a roadmap for the kind of reporting that might uh, provide real value on uh, the domestic level. Great, Dan. Thank you so much. Uh, for it's, it's wonderful to see, by the way, that, um, that your remarks have brought people to their feet. There are some places to sit along the sides, a little bit over there and over there if you'd like, uh, so you all don't have to stand. Um, next up is Sheila, would you mind, please? Thank you, Daniel, and thanks to everyone here for your interest. Uh, the Center for Responsive Politics, as Daniel says, is a nonpartisan nonprofit research group based in Washington. And I'm here to talk to you about uh, just the lobbying and revolving door work that we do. Uh, one uh, important part is just to set the stage here. Uh, CRP's process is, as with other money in politics, to gather the data from the federal government, in this case the Senate Office of Public Records, and then to process, uh, classify it by industry, standardize it by organization, and, uh, and analyze it so that we can aggregate the data by client, by registrant, by client industry, and uh, issue an agency targeted, and to a degree by lobbyist. All told, our research has provided the premier free resource on total lobbying, tabulating $3.5 billion spent for each of the last two years running and more than $30 billion spent since 1998. We also analyzed the data, like our recap March 10th, uh, of the lobbying on the administration's top priorities over the last two years, the stimulus, health care, financial reform, and cap and trade legislation, which you can find on our blog. Uh, this work is difficult, requiring 
painstaking attention to, to detail and costly, although not nearly as costly as it was as it used to be back when we had to pay to key the data. Uh, still, this project alone currently runs about seventy-five to one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a year. Uh, along with this, uh, the revolving door is a companion database we maintain that tracks former covered official positions for lobbyists and all also the current. Uh, government positions of former lobbyists. Our database in currently includes uh, nearly 12,000 individuals. We started as the uh, registered lobbyists as the base, and then we've added on to that uh, uh, from uh, kind of people on the move uh, kinds of um, uh, daily uh, listings. With this research, uh, folks like Dan can measure uh, that three, quarter of, three quarters of all oil and gas lobbyists have spun through the revolving door. So the revolving door is, is prevalent. Why is this up to a private entity like ours to do? Putting out reliable summary numbers uh, per client and registrant is something that the government can and should do, but this would presumably take more political will and more money, something that is certainly unlikely in the current cost-cutting environment. And it's highly unlikely that Congress would ever agree to invest the resources necessary to do the classification by industry, by standardization, by organization. However, if the government were willing to invest in the entity identification work across all government data, this would benefit those who monitor lobbying expenditures enormously. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what would be useful to have our list of, uh, our wish list and our frustrations, uh, starting with deregistration. In a report we did on this last June, the question we sought to answer was, did the recent increased re uh, regulation of lobbyists spur deregistration by motivating them to deregister and either cease lobbying work or perhaps continuing to lobby but going under the radar? The answer we found is yes, there seemed to be a correlation between added regulations and deregistration. The new LD203 regulations preceded an increased level of deregistration, as did the period after Obama's additional restrictions banning lobbyists from advisory committees and from lobbying on TARP and stimulus funds, which was followed by an additional, though smaller, rise in deregistrations. All told, we measured an increase that was three times the level of pre-LOGA uh, deregistrations. We also found a wide variance in understanding uh, of what is the definition of registration. In fact, uh, even the White House, with uh, all of the effort it put into not hiring uh, registered lobbyists, had three uh, registered lobbyists on their roles, uh, on their roster. Uh, so we'd also uh, hope to have uh, specific lobbying visits. So tying lobbyists to members via specific meetings records would be ideal, because then we could more easily monitor relationships. Right now, those relationships are hidden. Members don't generally release their calendars, and lobbyists need not disclose the specific member or office staff they are meeting with. Therefore, it's impossible to know whether a lobbying relationship exists and whether it's being cemented via campaign contributions to either campaign or leadership pack. As it is, we can verify relationships via contributions, but that's a one-way transaction. So knowing whether the door has been opened would provide highly useful additional information. Uh, lobbyist IDs. Having unique lobbyist IDs would make our work and the work of many others using lobbying data far, far easier. Lobbyists linked to specific issues and agencies. There are things that the Congress could do right now to improve disclosure. Stop suppressing the data. We had access to lobbyists per specific issue or per agency prior to the XML feed uh, being released because we were scraping it, but now that they are serving up the data via XML, it is off limits to us. So it's one giant leap forward and then a small step backward as far as we're concerned. Uh, finally, House and Senate data should be the same. We know from long experience, uh, we started doing this research back in 1996, that the, these data sets have conflicting information. They should not. If the data is filed separately, then Congress should use the reconciliation to enforce better disclosure, looking for missing or inconsistent reports. Uh, finally, I just want to add that uh, the time uh, that it takes from submission to the report being accessible on our site is now three to four days, up from weeks or months, uh, that it would have taken us back in 1996. So I'll uh, add to those comments later. Great. Thank you so much. Lisa. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Lisa Rosenberg, and I'm a professional lobbyist. I've been accused, if that's the right word, of not being a real lobbyist. Referring to me and to Tom Sussman, Howard Marlowe, the president of the American League of Lobbyists, told the Hill newspaper, the fact is none of these folks are up on the Hill doing lobbying work every day like a professional lobbyist does. Now, I mention this not to pick a fight and not because I'm sensitive. 
Uh, if you're a lobbyist anymore, I think you have to have pretty thick skin. I mention this because it illustrates perfectly why I think we need to have comprehensive lobbyist disclosure. If lobbyists were required to report the offices they meet with very soon after they meet with them, Mr. Marlowe would know how much of my time I spent on the Hill, who I was talking to, and what I was talking about. And it would be good for him to know this. If he saw that I was meeting with staff for Senate rules to discuss the LDA, I imagine he'd want to follow pretty closely on my heels to tell them all the ways that I was mistaken. And I think that would be great for the dialogue and the way the information gets shared on Capitol Hill. Fundamentally, lobbyists are educators. And more disclosure would ensure that decision makers have a more complete understanding of all sides of the issues. Improving lobbyist disclosure is good for Congress and good for lobbyists. The purpose of the LDA is to increase public confidence in the integrity of government. The LDA has failed in that regard because of incomplete coverage, deficient reporting, and delayed reporting. It should come as no surprise that the public still perceives lobbyists as backroom dealers. A November 2010 Gallup poll asked people to rank the honesty and ethical standards of people in various professions. Lobbyists ranked the lowest in any field, including lawyers, car salesmen, and members of Congress. 61% of respondents ranked lobbyists' ethics as very low. At the same time, the public supports better lobbyist disclosure. Nearly 9 out of 10 uh, respondents supported greater disclosure by lobbyists about their work and their level of congressional contacts, according to a 2006 George Washington University poll. What that tells me is that lobbying transparency appeals to the public at large and to voters specifically. And I'm not alone. Senator Gillibrand is a great example of someone who takes advantage of the public's support for transparency. Her own campaign website noted that she was one of the first members of Congress to publish all of her official meetings online the day after they occur. The site pointed out that by publishing her official meetings, voters get to see who is lobbying Kirsten and on what issues. If a voter sees that she has met with a group whose views they oppose, they can contact her office to make sure their viewpoints are heard too. I would only add to that to say that better lobbyist disclosure would also enable citizens or interests to identify others that support their cause and then use that information to build coalitions or to amplify their message. Now, of course, LDA reforms are not entirely about improving the image of Congress or lobbyists or even improving the dialogue on Capitol Hill. Better lobbyist disclosure serves to reduce corruption and the appearance of corruption. This is even more important after the Supreme Court decision in the Citizens United case. That decision created a stronger link between campaign spending and lobbying. Now a lobbyist can, without ever saying a word, imply that their clients will spend millions of dollars on negative campaign ads if senators or representatives do not do what the lobbyist asks. Transparency is the only immediately available tool to check this type of potential undue influence, providing watchdogs and journalists with the tools they need to uncover possible conflicts of interests or links between comp contributions or campaign ads and decision making. The Sunlight Foundation supports truly comprehensive, transparent, and timely lobbyist disclosure uh, that would contain three major disclosure components. First, at a minimum, Everyone who is paid to lobby must report his or her lobbying. Second, lobbyists should report the names of the offices uh, that they're meeting with and what they're meeting about. Third, the biggest bundlers of campaign contributions should report all of their lobbying activities. And what's also key to this is that all reporting must be done in real time and online so that the public has timely access to this information about lobbying. Now let me be clear. The last thing I want to do is burden myself or my very small firm with more paperwork. And if it's done right, additional lobbying disclosures do not have to be a burden. All of the information that we're seeking can be reported by lobbyists during the cab ride back to their offices from Capitol Hill. Sunlight created a model app uh, that you could use on, on cell phones that, uh, and I want to show you how it works. I've got my colleague who's up there with our mobile disclosure form. And just using the example I gave earlier, uh, if I had talked to Senator Schumer from New York, you click on New York, find the office of Senator Schumer, and I talk to staff, so click on other staff, committee, rules committee. Bill number, unfortunately, we're going to have to make up a bill number since there isn't one yet. Client represented, Sunlight Foundation, 
LDA code would be GOV for government reform. The action requested, co-sponsor a bill. Hit submit. Now, of course, that goes nowhere because we don't have real-time online disclosure, but if we did, you can see how that would be um, you know, a convenient reporting tool that I think would actually ease a lot of the reporting requirements on lobbyists right now. Uh, now, one more thing I would like to point out um, is that lobbyist disclosure really can be good for lobbyists. Now, on the American League of Lobbyists' own Facebook page, there was a comment that I think is very telling. All posted that in the State of the Union, the President, for the second year in a row, voiced his support for stronger lobbyist disclosure. In response, one lobbyist said, I'm going to quote this, great, put it out there, I have nothing to hide. In fact, it would be a great free advertisement about how well I and my firm represent our clients. And I hope that more lobbyists are like him and are willing to see the upside of disclosure. And perhaps more importantly, I would hope that members of Congress embrace changes to the LDA as a way to create more balance and better dialogue on Capitol Hill. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Paul? Goodness, where to start? Um, first, let me say, I guess I now I know why I was sent here today to, to take all the arrows. So, no, um, I, I appreciate the opportunity here. Um, when you can come together and talk about the state of your profession, I think it's a good thing. I think we do have to talk about all these issues, and I, I do want to address some of the things, particularly start with uh, the little display we just saw. Uh, we talk about the Lobbying Disclosure Act, what you're required to do, and so I'm going to veer up from my notes here today. Um, the only difference what she offered up there right now is she put Senator Schumer up there. That's the only thing right now you don't technically have to do. So the other information is up there. If you choose to put you met with Senator Schumer, that's okay. But you don't have to. But by me putting that I met with Senator Schumer's office, not necessarily telling you who I met with. So it's not the true transparency that we're, we're hearing about. If you're talking about true transparency, you're talking about the individual person that you met with. And again, we can talk, I hope we get a lot of the questions about that because there are some problems with the way you do that. So that's nothing, what you just saw is nothing more than what the current LDA asked for other than mentioning Senator Schumer. If you want to add that in there, God forbid, I, I'm happy to support that. Um, I don't think most lobbyists will oppose, to, oppose those types of things. Um, we can talk about the other stuff. Um, I did serve as president of the American League of Lobbies during the Jack Abramoff scandal, and I'm sure most of you know Jack Ab or are aware of Jack Abramoff. So I've been called every name of the book, and so I'm used to it. Um, I think lobbying is a credible profession. It's one that we should have discussions about. But when we talk about this, we have to be realistic about some of the things that we're talking about. We can't go trampling on the Constitution just because we don't necessarily like the word lobbyist or lobbying. The Constitution gives you the right to petition your government. And when we start crossing that line of who should be able to do that, who shouldn't be able to do that, we're now cut, talking about constitutional rights. We're talking about taking those rights away from one group of, of, of people versus another. It's no different than discriminating against a person from their skin color. So we have to be very careful about that. Um, Regulating for the sake of regulating is not good for this profession, it's not good for this country. When I was president, um, we met with one senior leadership office about lobbying reform efforts that they were trying to push through. And we pointed out the flaws and the loopholes in what they were proposing. And what I was told was, we don't care. We need to show the public that we, we have done something and we have to come out with a victory on this. Okay. Again, folks, you, ha you have some folks up here who know this issue, but you don't have other key people to have up here. You don't have members of Congress. This doesn't work without members of Congress. If you want to have some transparency and you want some more reforms, you've got to have members of Congress here. You've got to get them to support these initiatives. Um, and I guess when you talk about, we're talking about two different issues here. We're talking about lobbying disclosure and we're talking about campaign finance. Yes, there's some correlation between the two. But you have to have a separate discussion on campaign finance. That's when you have to have the members of Congress. I can't do anything about campaign finance. It's within the, my right to give a donation if I want to. That doesn't mean I'm seeking any special privilege uh, or anything else of benefit. It's an opportunity for me and my clients to support people who support our issues. People like in this room not going to believe me. That's fine. But if you want to have a true conversation about campaign finance, you've got to get the people in the room that are going to be able to make those changes. And that's members of Congress. I, I for one, and I know my colleague Dave Wenhold, Dave still has a, a, a moratorium. He won't give to members of Congress right now. It's been two, almost two and a half years now that he's taken that pledge. I did it when I was president. Um, Dave's doing it now. He's now no longer president. But again, there are some of us who believe that we, uh, campaign contributions aren't why we're successful. And so, yes, have, have there been pay to play? Absolutely. I'm not going to sit here and tell you no. Jack Abramoff is a clear sign of that. But for everyone here, to, or anybody to say that the system doesn't work, Anybody who broke the law in the Abramoff scandal went to prison. 
They weren't, they weren't lobbyists. They went to prison for their activity because they were members of Congress or congressional staffers. One lobbyist went to prison. That was Jack Abramoff. So we have to re be cognizant of that. Um, we are the most heavily regulated profession. We file four times a year with the Lobbying Disclosure Act. If you count the LDA 203, which lists our campaign contribution, that's another two. And, if, and for others like myself who have a small business or, or firm, I have to file two. I have to file one for myself and one for my firm. So I'm, I'm duplicating the work here. So we, I'm filing six times, seven times a year, in, eight, eight times a year, I guess, in many cases. So um, for somebody to say there's not transparency, you can find who I represent online very quickly. Um, I was a big supporter, as, is the American, as was the American League of Lobbies, on online uh, filings. It makes it easier for us. We were happy to work with the uh, clerk's office to make that happen, um, as were other groups. So I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're here having a frank discussion, but you know, inaccurate shots at people who aren't here, not going to help the discussion. I think there is common ground here, but if we're going to create lobbying, if there's a need for lobbying reform, we're going to have to make sure that all the rules apply to everybody. We can't have carve-outs. John McCain said to us back when the Abramoff scandal happened, he was less worried about Jack Abramoff because there was a paper trail for Jack. You could find out some of the things that were in the press. The people he, were cons he was concerned about was Michael Scanlon, a PR consultant who didn't have to file or register. Those are what we have to talk about here today, folks. If you want to make the system cleaner, if you want to make it more transparent, you have to make sure that you cover everybody. And that covers PR consultants, that covers every grassroots consultants, and that will even cover some of the folks who are PR uh, paid media, media people who advocate for an issue. Anybody who is directly related with uh, ad, uh, advocating for or against an issue should have to register. If we're talking about all the things that I've heard here today, there can't be carve-outs. There can't be carve-outs for nonprofits. There can't be carve-outs for universities. They, everybody has to fall under the same umbrella. Otherwise, it's, it's just not going to work. Um, uh, one more thing before I end here. Um, we talk about the 2007 LDA changes. A lot of people said, and Speaker Pelosi at the time said they were great. The president himself said these are great changes. Yet the president talks out of one side of his face and, and does another. He talks about how we should report our, our meetings with members of Congress. But yet the president will send his key staff down to a coffee shop a block away to have these meetings, which are not reportable. So how is that talking about true transparency and reform? So if we're going to do it, we're going to have to do it the right way. And that he can't do those things and, and, and talk about how you know he's doing it the right way and we're doing it the wrong way. You can't say, I'm not going to hire lobbyists to work in my administration. But yet, okay, well, you got a bunch of them now. You had to give them waivers. So you can't have it both ways, in my opinion. And then finally, um, campaign finance. The gift rule. Everybody thought that that was a good thing to get rid of. You know, it works for me. It wasn't spending money giving gifts anyway. But you cannot now say that it was a great thing because it now got rid of gifts. It doesn't. You're pushing people to the campaign side of things. You're saying, I can't take a staffer out for a, a $30, $40 meal, or even say 100 at the most. If I'm buying somebody at 100, for $100 meals, we got real problems in this country. But I can now call up that office and say, or the campaign folks and say, I'd like to meet with Senator X today, have breakfast with him. Sit for two hours. Let's have, let's have a discussion about my issues that my clients have. And at the end of the day, all I have to do is go, thank you very much for your two-hour center. By the way, here's your campaign check. What's worse, me buying a meal for a staffer and giving an opportunity to go off the hill and talk about an issue, or me slipping that check to a member of Congress? I would say slipping that check. So I think we have to have those discussions. We can't just say and point the finger and say, lobbyists is bad, transparency is going to solve the problem. We've got to figure out a way to do it, and, and it's reasonable, it's fair, and that everybody is covered. If you don't cover everybody, it's a moot point to even have this conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Tom? Wow. Uh, Make sure your mic's on. Yeah. I guess uh, I come out somewhere in between. Uh, I'm here principally to report on um, a recent task force report of the American Bar Association uh, administrative law section. It is a task force report. It has not yet been adopted by the ABA House of Delegates, Board of Governors, or even the section. Uh, but uh, I was very much, very deeply involved in it, and uh, I'm very committed to um, and personally believe in the recommendations that were made. So it's a pleasure to have an opportunity to report them to you. Uh, and I should say that uh, there were 20 members and observers. Uh, Dan was part of it. Uh, there are a few in the audience here who participated. 
uh, a number of um, law firms and lobbyists and lobbying firms, uh, law firms that lobby, uh, and uh, the report represents a consensus. I'm going to just throw out very briefly, skim the top of what it recommends so we can get into some questions, but I'm also going to suggest a few things that it doesn't recommend because that does indicate uh, in some ways where I come out different from, um, uh, from some of the proposals. Uh, expanded disclosure. Uh, our task force report, and by the way, it is on the web uh, under the administrative law section uh, uh, site. Uh, expanded disclosure that would pick up uh, additional uh, lobbyists by doing away with the um, uh, 20 percent uh, requirement uh, for a minimum uh, to report. Uh, an expansion uh, of um, uh, the need to report, as Paul suggested, support entities that are involved, uh, such as uh, those involved in exactly what you mentioned, grassroots organizing, media generating, um, uh, you know, consultants, uh, PR consultants. Uh, they, would be, they would not be lobbyists for purposes of whatever um, uh, discrimination and administration wants to impose. Uh, or um, uh, uh, other, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, legal prohibitions, but they would be uh, required to file 203s, and they would be uh, th the amount of money would be disclosed. Uh, and then um, uh, th it, finally, um, uh, the LD2 form would be expanded to require uh, uh, additional uh, disclosure elements, but not contact reporting. Uh, and that's an issue, I guess, that Paul and I stand on this end of the spectrum separate from all of the other speakers. Uh, and I hope we'll have an opportunity. I won't go into it now, but I have at least five or six reasons why I think it's a bad idea. Uh, and uh, uh, frankly, the burden on the lobbyist is uh, that, that in large part could in well be uh, uh, alleviated by a... a um, uh, cell phone or smartphone app to fill in after you finish with the meeting, but um, uh, I think it's a bad idea for the lobbyist and the member, and we can get back to that. Uh, the second part of the task force report uh, addressed the pay to play. Uh, uh, the, the heart of it at the heart is a simple concept. Uh, if you make a campaign contribution to a member, you can't lobby that member for two years. If you lobby a member, you can't make a campaign, you can't, I'm sorry, you can't do campaign fundraising for that member for two years. So it, doesn't, it, it does not inhibit the individual contribution. We discussed that, and our very smart constitutional law professors suggested that under the current Supreme Court jurisprudence, there may be a problem uh, prohibiting individual campaign contributions, which have been equated to First Amendment speech. But uh, so far, at least, bundling, fundraising, serving as treasurer, uh, et cetera, are not, um, haven't yet been uh, considered uh, 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 to be directly speech by the courts, and so we would simply prohibit that for a two-year period um, uh, with, uh, we believe, compelling governmental interest to do so. And finally, uh, there are a few miscellaneous proposals. Uh, one is to um, uh, simply require uh, all persons who lobby for earmarks uh, to certify in their uh, semi-annual LD203 forms that they haven't contributed uh, or sought contributions from individuals or PACs for any member who was lobbied. So it's a little, um, it's a little broader prohibition for earmark uh, lobbying. And then we also um, address contingent fees, not with an across-the-board ban, but with a ban of the use of contingent fee lobbying for earmarks, tax breaks, uh, uh, guarantees, uh, contracts, and other, in, in, other direct benefits that have a, a monetary value. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, the need for greater enforcement, and this is one that those of you who have been involved in lobbying uh, disclosure legislation know that every time the issue comes up, there's always a debate where to put enforcement. Um, it remains right now in the uh, House and Senate uh, to collect and refer, and the Justice Department, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, to bring cases. That has not proved a very um, uh, successful uh, way of doing business. Uh, consideration is always given to the FEC because it ought to be. 
uh, a place where, uh, with, with rulemaking authority, with civil enforcement authority, with congressional participation, uh, where lobbying regulation could work, uh, but it's been a dysfunctional agency, and so the task force proposed uh, the civil division of the Department of Justice uh, to have that authority. So those were the recommendations. Just for those of you who are interested in following it, uh, uh, comments uh, and suggestions and criticisms are being invited by the ABA now. Uh, if you want to send them to me, that's fine. I can refer them to the task force and the council of the administrative law section. And it won't be until August that there's any action on the part of the House of Delegates to approve or not uh, these recommendations. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, I see we've got some more folks joining us. There are a couple of chairs over on the far side of the room if you wish to try to wander over there. And if not, uh, just make yourselves as comfortable as you can. Um, We've heard uh, reference to a couple of different reports. Um, the Sunlight Foundation ha didn't mention this, but I'm sure they will. They have um, been working on uh, lobbying reform legislation. You, there's the ABA's task force report, and there's the five um, lobbying principles that was put forth by the American League of Lobbyists. On all of your chairs is a piece of paper that provides hyperlinks to where all of those documents can be found, uh, as well as a bunch of other useful resources, such as the CRP report that Sheila had mentioned. Um, so that if you're trying to find these things, instead of trying to search around, I, I put them together. And if you'll excuse the spelling errors, I think they'll, you'll find that they're pretty useful. Uh, so uh, I'd like to come back around and start with, uh, start with Dan. Um, and you were talking earlier uh, about, about this 22,000-fold uh, return on investment in, in this one particular instance that you were working on where um, for every dollar that was spent lobbying, the tax break resulted uh, was $220 for, um, uh, for the clients of the firm that was doing so. And the question that I have for you, and it goes, I think, to the substance of what we're, what, all of what we're talking about here is, what would be helpful when you're trying to do your job? What would make it easier to find uh, you know, what you're looking for? Uh, you had mentioned a little bit about uh, FARA. Uh, the FARA database, the Foreign Agent uh, Registration Act database that tracks people who are who lobby for foreign governments. What in particular about that do you think would be useful, or is there something else that you think would be particularly handy? Well, well I think, and it dovetails, I think, with, some, with, with what some on the other side of the table have mentioned, and I'm interested to hear about what the concerns are about basically contact reporting. I mean, I think that, you know, that's sort of the bottom line that ties things together. Right now, you can... Uh, if I'm going through a lobbying report, I can I can tell uh, uh, you can tell which lobbyists have lobbied on which uh, bills, uh, but you can't tell how much was spent on that. You know, you don't know if it took them a day or if they spent eight months on it. You know, in terms of the 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 overall uh, workload of that given firm or that given lobbyist. So, and I think uh, you know that that the. So when you look at FARO records, uh, I actually remember the first time I uh, had, you know, did a story that was related to, to FARA, and I was not real familiar with it, and I was just like, wow, this is awesome. I mean, it was like a gold mine of, of, of information compared to what I was used to under the, the con you know, the congressional system. Um, the, you know, they, they're required to report all meetings. They're required to report, you know, when they happen, they required they report the you know the contracts are public, the uh, amount of money. I'm not saying going that far in a domestic context. There are national security reasons undergirding that system, and that you know bolster the argument for that level of intrusiveness. But on the other hand, I am in, I am interested to hear what uh, some practicing lobbyists what the concerns are about uh, simply reporting who you actually talk to. Um, and why that that could pose a, a problem uh, from the lobbying perspective. Okay. Would, would somebody like to address that? Sure. We'll both. You want to go ahead? Okay. Yeah. Sh sure. Um, let, let's start with the Gillibrand uh, example. Um, uh, it, as I understand it, she posts official visits. Um, what about unofficial visits? Is a fundraiser an official visit or an unofficial visit? Is a meeting out of the Capitol, off the the um, the lobby, is that official or unofficial? If it doesn't go through her scheduling secretary, is it official or unofficial? And the reason that's so important is because I'm going to support the candidate running against her next year. 
And uh, I'm going to show just how big a lie she's engaged in trying to tell the public how transparent that is and how many people she's meeting that aren't posted and how dis absolutely um, distrustful that kind of approach is. But then I also, as a political consultant, represent another candidate who's um, running against a conservative Southern member of Congress, um, Christian conservative, and we are having the right to life and uh, marijuana uh, lobbyists visit his office two or three times a day because I want my candidate to be able to report uh, what a hypocrite this guy is, uh, spending more time with uh, these uh, sinful lobbyists than he does with uh, religious lobbyists. Uh, so, I mean, and finally, even if I'm perfectly honest and I'm up above board as a lobbyist, when I come up to the congressional offices, um, I know that Paul's tracking me because he has a client who's on the other side of this issue. And so I'm actually going to visit a half dozen offices on my way to where I want to go and talk substance so that I can list all seven of them. You won't know the difference between the ones that were dropped by, hello, here's a piece of paper on our issue, and the ones where we spent a half hour in serious strategic negotiations. Now, I didn't mention the burden issue because the ABA is only engaged in communicating with Congress on about 120 issues a year with nine registered lobbyists. So you want to break that out issue-wise? I mean, I can't afford not to talk about more than one issue when I actually get FaceTime with a member or chief of staff. And so that's going to be, I'd say, at least complicated. I, I think Tom said it perfectly, but I would just add, I mean, what constitutes a meeting? I, I do a lot of charity work with members of Congress. I have nothing to do with basketball, and I will tell you that I have a, a personal policy that if I do some charity work with them, I don't lobby them. So that that's a personal thing You're for alone. me. You're alone. Well, I, I, maybe, but I, I think there are others. Um, <laughs> But if I'm down, walking down the hall and I see Congressman X and I pull him aside for a few minutes because I haven't been able to see him about the date and when we need him there and things like that for a basketball game, um, are you going to play this year? You know, we need you there. We got X amount of people there. Now he leaves and says, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm going I'm to play this year. Do I now have to report that as a meeting? Does he have to report that as a meeting? Um, what if you have a member of Congress who goes to a coalition meeting to address folks? Does he now or she have to now collect business cards and say, I met with all these people on this issue? Do I have to do the same? So it is very burdensome. Not that we care. I don't personally care. I'm not going to track Tom or anybody else. I don't have the time to track people. I know what my issues are. I know where I'm going, and I know what i got to get done. Um, so I just think it's an unwieldy system to think particularly that you could do it every day. It's just not possible. I just don't believe that. One, and, and who's it going to benefit? If transparency is for the general public to see who we're meeting with, okay, I could understand that. But this isn't for the general public. The general public's not going to know why I met with Senator B or X, Y, and Z. It's just going to be a name to them. They may never have heard that person. What are they going to do with that? This is, let's be honest, this is for the media. This is for the media to track this. And, and we, again, no, no problems with the media. But there, don't, let's not pretend that there aren't some overinflated stories that Paul Miller met with Congressman Nex on this issue. Oh, my God, they, they were successful. There had to be a quid pro quo here. There had to be a pay to play here, even if I did give them money. Why can't it just be that I was good at my job? I'm not giving hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm, I'm low rent when it comes to that. So you can, <laughs> whatever, however you want to label me. So I'm not buying anything. I'm going to a fundraiser just like everybody else and with 30 to 40 of my closest friends who are spending the same amount of money, maybe some more. I'm not buying that vote, regardless of what people may think. So uh, I'll just leave it at that. Well, I have, <clears throat> I feel like I have to defend the argument that contacts really should be, de should be reported. Um, you know, getting to Tom's point in terms of Jill Brand compared to what the lobbyists would have to report, what's an official meeting, what's not, and the lobbyists know exactly what they're doing. If a lobbyist is going to a meeting to ask for substantive help on an issue, they know that. Their clients know that. That's how they bill their clients. Um, so it's not that difficult to figure out why you're going up to the Hill. And again, I think that gets to Paul's point as well. Um, if you're asking a member of Congress to join you in a basketball game, then that's not a substantive issue, asking for government help for something. Um, and Paul's not going to be billing any of his clients for saying, hey, let's go to this basketball game. 
uh, you know, again, I think that the lobbyists, uh, the, the, you know, let's, let's take this a little more seriously. Lobbyists know who they're going to, what they want, what they're asking for. They have that knowledge base. Um, so I don't think it's going to be that burdensome them, for them to figure out what meetings are substantive. You know, we're not asking to report for, hey, how you doing, Senator, when you just see someone in the hall. We're not asking for reporting of, you know, a request for a meeting or just sort of logistics. It's, it's a substantive request for government action, and uh, that language is already in the law. Um, and I think getting to the point of, you know, that I think Tom made in terms of um, how these meetings can be used against you, you know, again, I think if everyone has to report, you kind of balance out the issues. So, you know, when I worked on the Hill, I took meetings with, with everyone who wanted one, um, or our office did. And um, if they all have to be reported, then I think that sort of diffuses the, the heat that can be attached to any one particular meeting. Um, so I don't, I think that these are issues that we can work through that, you know, they're not easy issues, but I think that definitions can be created to really resolve the issues so that we have meaningful reporting so that people like the media can act as a conduit for the public. It is for the public and it is for the media. That's how we get our, that's how the public gets its information. Uh, and I think that that's, that is important. That is what is, tra what transparency is about. It's also for interest groups. They can track, you know, their interests and who's meeting with whom. And again, as I was saying, you know, kind of leveling the playing field, balancing, balancing the playing field so that all sides of the issues can be disclosed. Can I just, can actually I, I'm going to give Dan a chance to see if you want to weigh in on this or do you want to? Uh, well, I don't have anything. I, I guess I, I, I do have one question for, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the argument from the lobbying perspective, basically that it's too, too much to keep track of, too, too complicated. I mean, these are by and large law firms. Uh, there, there are a lot of law, a lot of law firms do lobbying, um, lobbying, and then there are obviously specialized lobbying firms. I'm quite sure that they require uh, the the clients require they want to know exactly what you're doing for for their money. So you're, I mean, I think you're keeping track of it anyway, aren't you? I, I'm just, I'm not quite understanding that part of the argument about it being too much. Uh, just work. two things. First, I mean, what about the the small one person people person <coughs> shop? I mean, if I have five different clients that I'm representing one day on different issues, I'm running around, I don't have time to, okay, now I did this, i got to add another 30 minutes or 15 minutes into my schedule to somehow track this and write this down. Um, it did take 30 minutes. I mean, all right, it, but if I'm on the Hill, I'm not going to use my, I don't use my cell phone for that. So I'm going to have to carry a personal computer or something or go back to my office and spend some more time at the end of the day when I want to get to home to, to play with my kids. At the end of the day, i got to now write con uh, contacts down. If we're going to go that far, what do you do with the what I call professional flying people who may come here three or four times a year for an association, not registered lobbyists, but asking for something? Do we now require them to report that? Should we require them to register? Because they're doing what I do. They're just not doing it on a daily basis. They're doing it three, four times, maybe once a quarter, but they're still coming here and doing what I do. We should still have the information and track those people because they're asking for just what I'm asking for. And if they, if they know what I'm doing, why shouldn't I have the ability to know what they're doing? And I would agree with that. Um, I mean, I think that, and you know, Tom mentioned this too, closing the 20% loophole, ensuring that anyone who is paid to lobby reports has to be part of any reform. There cannot be exceptions. I completely agree with but that. But you're talking about everybody, in, just about everybody in America is going to have to register. You're going to, you're going to call on associations to cancel their flying days because everybody who comes here is going to be considered a, a, a lobbyist. I think they're the, coming here and lobbying on a specific issue, but they're not professional lobbyists. I think, ta I think the ABA Lobbying Task Force right. addresses this particular point. Yeah, it, it still it re retains a uh, monetary threshold, so it doesn't catch people who aren't paid to come in a certain amount of money. But let, let me get back. Corporations, trade associations, and most lobbying firms um, that do retainer work don't keep hourly. I mean, I, I practiced law for 27 years. You're absolutely right. Every law firm, we keep every either six or 15 minutes worth of time that the lawyer spends, including lobbying, including who, how, and when. But uh, we've, we've tried time reporting. Uh, I see a few of my colleagues smiling who are in the audience uh, uh, for uh, the American Bar Association. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it really does add a great deal of time, and it's often uh, unclear to us. I mean, we, we, we know who we t we're talking to, but the issues often sort of meld in terms of uh, a lot of work we do is preparatory, uh, uh, involves uh, relationship building, which isn't an official ask, 
I mean, when the ABA president comes into town, we try to take her or him up to meet with chairman of committees and because we also provide assistance and information and support for, for some of them. Uh, and, and we actually, I mean, I, I know you wouldn't believe it. We actually go on a fair amount of uh, uh, visits where there is not an, an, uh, a request for any official action. Uh, are they important? Yes. Are they a waste of time? Absolutely not. Do they support the lobbying objectives? I sure hope so. Would they be reportable under your system? No. Uh, they shouldn't be, but I'm just saying that, you know, there, there's nothing per, I just think that the, the noise level will be so high when every lobbyist is reporting every contact that despite your terrific computers and your wonderful reports, that, that the ability to extract really useful information out of this is going to be uh, not worth the investment. So I, I, if, I got a follow, if I could ask a follow-up, sure. and this is just a crazy flip the script kind of question, I guess. What if... What if you flip it the other way and the burden is on the off the member's office or the committee's office? I, apropos the visitor logs at the White House. I, I think what you're going to see and what we saw in 2007 when members of Congress were going through this, they're going to shut themselves off to us. Who's going to want to do that paperwork? They're going to say, well, I'm just not going to meet you. And, and people can't say that didn't happen in 2007, 2008. It did. A lot of people were told, I'm not going to meet with you. You're a registered lobbyist. I just don't want to have the hassle. So it's going to happen. And again, is that good for our government? Is that good for our system? I don't think so. So I, I want to turn in, in sort of come at this from a different perspective. Um, sort of, you know, we're talking about the reporting side. Let's talk about the side of, of what's actually being made available from what we have now. Uh, so I'm going to turn to you, Sheila. Um, during sort of your introductory remarks, you were talking about entity IDs, which is an incredibly uh, terrible term, which is basically means trying to figure out who, whether the person that you're talking about is the same person. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit more about that and the problems that you're currently facing? So just trying to track the data that currently exists and sort of where those gaps can be filled. Uh, sure. Well, we in our data are trying to fingerprint two to three million records each year, and a large part of that has to do with the individual donations giving $200, more than $200 in campaign contributions, but we also do ID uh, lobbyists, and part of that is because we want to be able to see whether those lobbyists are uh, working on specific issues and then at least contributing to members who have jurisdiction over those issues in Congress. And so uh, that's just one kind of mashup that might be one combination of two disparate sets of data that might, one might do with the lobbying uh, information, but unique IDs would help tremendously uh, in our work to do that. We create unique IDs per individual lobbyist in our data so that we can say this person uh, who's representing these clients this year had represented these other clients and the other industries in previous years. Uh, it would also help enormously. So it would help in our standard research. It would help with mashups with other uh, kinds of data like the campaign contributions. It would help enormously in tracking deregistrations, which of course has been uh, a hot topic of conversation over the last few years with uh, regulation reform. Uh, because the ID, uh, IDs would help us identify how many lobbyists have deregistered, as would the addition of a checkbox. Uh, so one another simple uh, reform in the disclosure forms that would uh, seem to be a common sense change uh, that could be put in place now. Um, this would help us examine whether reform policies are having their intended effects or whether they're having unintended effects, which of course was alleged with the, um, with the Obama administration's changes. Um, we've so, so invested an enormous amount of our time just in doing that kind of standardization of individuals. So, so let me play this out a little bit. So the way things exist right now, and I'm going to pick on you, Paul, just because you have a simple name. Sure. Uh, that's probably common. I'm a simple person. <laughs> <laughs> so as, as things, the way things work now is um, Paul's firm files these forms, right? It's not Paul individually, mm -hmm. or is that correct? Uh, that's right. The, the, regis right. the right. registrant. So, so if I want to, if I want to follow all the contacts that he's reporting, um, is there there isn't a way to know that this Paul Miller here is the same as this Paul Miller being reported in some other place? Right. So you have to go through and look at each one to make sure it's the same person. Is that is that right? Right. We don't have any ID provided to us by the Senate, uh, the Secretary of the Senate's office. Uh, right. Although, the, although all lobbyists do have a unique ID that's known to the Senate and to the House. Is that right? We, can, can yeah, go ahead, please. Um, 
Yeah, we do, but I, I think an easy way to do this, and I may be in the minority in this, but um, maybe every lobby should have its own identification number so that you have to file every every time you fill out your LDA form, you have to put that next to your name. There's a box next to your name. Because, again, the, in the past, I, I write my name Paul A. Miller, and so I file that. But there are some days I forget, and I just put Paul Miller. So if I register, if I file Paul A. Miller, it picks up Paul it's A. Miller. to mislead us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. And if I file... The next quarter is Paul Miller. I'm the same person, but you may not know that, and you're going to have a hard time. Again, I don't think many of us in, in, in this profession would ha would care if we had a unique identifier. Um, it's not a big deal. It's in just another box next to your name, maybe that you have to check in. And it's and if you're doing electronically, it's going to stay in there from quarter to quarter. If you're if you're saving these documents anyway, I don't think it's a problem. Um, and I may be one of maybe a handful in this town who believe that. You know what? I've always been concerned that you know there is no real requirement to be a lobbyist other than you find a client, they pay, you hang up your shingle, and you file your reporting requirements. There's no there's no uh, required education. I mean, the American Legal Lobbyist has a program now that we're very proud of that we started before the Abramoff scandal. But I'm one who says, you know what? May, and it's un, probably unconstitutional. But maybe we should have a license. We should be licensed. Um, I, I I've talked to lawyers and they'll tell me it's unconstitutional. But I would support something like that. And I'm and that's not an American Legal Lobbyist position. That's my own. So I. I and I know that the ABA lobbying report also has a recommendation on, on this particular point with respect to unique IDs for, for lobbyists, but I want, I want to get to something that this side of the room has, has brought up, uh, which has to do with the 20% threshold. So as the law currently stands, and I, considering who's sitting next to me, I feel very um, apprehensive about summarizing it, but to become a federally registered lobbyist, you need basically three things. You need to make two lobbying contacts with a covered official. You need to spend 20% of your time lobbying and you need to spend over a certain threshold amount. And what I'm hearing from all three of you is that this 20% threshold, and I'm hearing this in different ways, but that this 20% threshold may not make sense. That uh, I'm hearing from you, Paul, that there's a lot of people that are doing lobbying support work. Um, you know, you, you referenced the Abramoff scandal, that there's a lot of people who are doing these kinds of behaviors that are simply not caught in the lobbying registration system. Uh, I know that uh, the ABA lobbying task force is reducing this number significantly as well, and I know that Sunlight is, is approaching this. So I, I sort of want to play through this just a little bit. And I'm going to start with, with the tough question. I think it's a tough question for Lisa. Um, so if you eliminate the 20% exemption, um, there's a lot of folks who are the small firms, who are the nonprofit lobbying shops. Like where I work at Sunlight, for example, we have a very small lobbying shop. Or you have the, the one or two person lobbyist, which is like, a, like at your firm as well. Um, is it fair to treat you know, the for-profit folks, the people who are representing corporations, the people who are representing those with deep pockets, should those folks be treated the same as, um, as the small fry in terms of uh, this 20%, need getting rid of this 20% rule either entirely or to some sort of threshold level? Um, I think that the concern that a lot of lobbyists for nonprofit organizations have with removing the 20% threshold um, comes as a result of some of the punitive, for lack of a better word, actions of the Obama, Obama administration, saying that they won't hire lobbyists or that lobbyists can't serve on boards. And I think certainly some of these nonprofit groups are saying, well, wait a minute, you know, we are different than the, the for-profit guys or the big guys or whatever, and, and we shouldn't have this punitive treatment. And I would just say that, um, from my perspective, I don't want to be in the position of picking and choosing you know, who should have to report and who shouldn't. Um, there could be a very powerful lobbyist for a nonprofit organization compared to uh, you know, somebody who's a for-profit lobbyist but you know, with a small firm, and that person could have a lot more influence, a lot more access than, than, than another person. So I don't think that it's fair to kind of, um, in terms of disclosure, break it up that way. I think I would personally rather see some of these punitive issues that are imposed on lobbyists by the Obama administration or others just removed. Um, if there's people that any administration doesn't want serving in, in its administration, use a different regime and a different de definition to divine, define who those people are. You shouldn't use a disclosure regime, which is what the LDA in essence really is, to say, oh, you can't work for me um, or you can't serve on this committee. So I don't think we should pick and choose who has to disclose and who doesn't. I don't think we get the big picture. Um, and I think it's just, it, it opens up the door to a lot of loopholes as well. I mean, I think there's ways that lobbyists could game the system and say, oh, I'm you know, only working night. 19% of the time, um, and there are there are huge lobbyists right now, um, 
you know, former members of Congress who don't report, but we know they're lobbying. And it's not that they're violating the current law, it's that they're relying on this 20% exception, and I don't think that that's something that we can continue in the future if we want full disclosure. I think we just had a successful day today because you and I just agreed on one statement. So <laughs> you, you saw it right here, folks. <laughs> um, I would agree with you. I, again, the question comes back to, well, just because you're small, you shouldn't have to do this, or and you're big, you should be, you should be more, you should be more, uh, rep have to require more reporting, and, and, and because you're bigger and you're nonprofit, so you're not making necessarily the money that the big company, uh, big corporate lawyer is, or lobbyist is. You could say make the same argument on the on the contacts issue. I'm a small guy, so why should I report and why should I have to spend that kind of time? I want I want to carve out too. If we start carving people out for this, that, and another thing, you're diluting the process. You're diluting this conversation. So if you capture one, you got to capture all. If you are advocating for or against something, um, and we have this threshold and these rules, you should be required to report. And it should be open to the public to find out who they are and what they're doing. Um, otherwise, we're just wasting our time, and we're just, uh, again, great TV. Tom? Uh, I would say Three years ago, when I was in a multinational private law firm representing large corporate and association clients, that I would say don't distinguish between nonprofits and for profits. After all, NRA, Washington Hospital Center, Yale University, Chamber of Commerce, I mean, they're all nonprofits. Now that I'm working for the American Bar Association, I'm beginning to rethink that subject. <laughs> so I, I do want to touch on uh, enforcement questions for a bit, and then we're going to move to questions from the audience. So uh, in terms of enforcement, I mean, everything that I've read in what we heard today is that enforcement is incredibly lax. The DOJ never brings prosecutions. Uh, the House and the Senate, the, the Senate uh, Office of Public Records, the clerk, uh, are not situated in such a way where they um, uh, clean up the records to make sure that the House and Senate records are, are um, rectified one against the other, or even you know, if people fail to file late or not at all, they're oftentimes not caught, you know, in the least. So there was, this is going to be a, this is a long question, but it'll be, it'll, there was a proposal, I think in the last Congress, um, sort of two pieces. One piece of it was that lobbyists should have to pay a small registration fee. I think it was $10 per lobbyist, and then if you file late, um, that there is a $500 late fee as a way of trying to fund the system. Now, I don't know if this is a good idea or a bad idea, um, but I'm trying to think of ways that uh, address the enforcement question. I know the ABA deals with this a little bit in terms of recommending that the civil division try to try to deal with this. But I was hoping, since I'm going down the list, Paul, um, do you have thoughts on how enforcement can be beefed up? I know this is one of the five principles that's in your. This um, is probably more suited for Tom and, and his background. But I would tell you, um, and I've said it during the Amarov scandal and and ever since, you can't legislate morality. People are going to break the law when they want to. If there are dollar signs there and they can find a way to cheat the system, there are always going to be those people that do it. Um, is that every lobbyist in town? No. I mean, it's a small few, and I think those of us in this, who've worked in this profession long enough know who those people are, and you stay away from them. Um, at some point in time, they're going to pay the piper. Jack did. Um, but is there a way to police everything that we do? No. There is, in my opinion, you're, you're on the honor system. And there are a lot of us in this profession who hold true to that. ALL has a code of ethics. We subscribe to that code of ethics. It's hanging in our office. Um, everybody who goes through our firm and it works for me um, has to go through the lobbying certificate program. Um, so there's things we can do. I just don't know how you enforce that. Again, particularly the revolving door. Who's going to drop a dime on a former member of Congress? I mean, they have access to the gyms, the parking lots, and every and the floor and things like that. And they're not registered lobbyists. They're just they're seeing their pals. So Tom, yeah. is, is honesty good enough? Yeah. Well, look, they're they're. There are two, a few different ways of looking at that. I mean, you can't enforce morality, but that doesn't mean we don't have laws against bribery or, or actually speeding. I mean, we don't, we don't catch everybody. Uh, but, uh, but having a law that sets a limit, uh, and some people get caught, uh, sends a pretty strong message to the rest of us who would engage in activity that was illegal, not just unethical, if it were defined as illegal. Uh, the and so therefore the fact that it the fact that uh, uh, enforcement is going to be imperfect uh, doesn't mean that there shouldn't be enforcement and shouldn't be penalties. Okay. The second side of it is how do you do this practically speaking? And there are a lot of political problems that we uh, avert to. And when I mentioned the FEC, I mean Congress doesn't want to put enforcement 
uh, in someone else's hands, especially when uh, it's enforcement that will implicate Congress, as almost every lobbyist violation does. Uh, and so, you know, it becomes very tough. I mean, uh, you know, Congress does not like, does not want to give an executive branch agency the authority to uh, effectively police something so near and dear to the heart of and close to the pocketbooks of uh, Congress and members of Congress's campaigns. Uh, it doesn't say that we can't do a better job. We try, you know, um, the initial uh, Federal Registration of Lobbying, uh, Regulation of Lobbying Act had criminal penalties only. That was a big mistake. Didn't work. Uh, uh, the Justice Department abandoned enforcement completely uh, decades uh, ago. We tried a different regime uh, under the uh, the um, uh, Lobbying Disclosure Act, and uh, it was uh, I would say, did I use the term imperfect? Uh, you know, U.S. attorneys uh, would send form letters and not follow up and. Uh, I think actually uh, BNA had to, was responsible for turning up the ex uh, through a freedom of information request uh, to get the uh, uh, the only instances of uh, just of uh, uh, Justice Department uh, consent actions and didn't tell us very much information about it. So it wasn't as, it isn't as if enforcement is used as a, a way of keeping people within the the lines because they don't tell you about enforcement. Well, the Hologa tried to do something about that through greater disclosure of referrals and actions taken. Uh, and I guess that may not be working that well either. Uh, so I'm not sure, you know, we'll think of some new ways to get at it. Uh, uh, but to say that uh, because it's difficult, uh, we shouldn't think in terms of enforcement, I think is, uh, is not the right approach here. So and with that, uh, I'd like to open up to questions. Um, and we have someone with the microphone, Melanie, uh, going around. We'll start in the front and work our way back. Um, so this gentleman here, please. Just a fair warning, it works much better if I hold it. So I'm going to be kind of awkwardly trying to come to you. I have a question about the um, extent of either interest or, or resistance to any of these proposals in terms of whether anybody has talked to uh, members of Congress um, about them and what you what you've heard back, what you think you might hear back, and it seems like none of these have gotten even to the uh, extent of um, of being introduced as legislation. Has anybody been talking to potential sponsors, that kind of stuff? That anything you can share along those lines? Now, mine's a real easy answer because, as I said early on, it's not yet the official position of the American Bar Association. So as the ABA's chief lobbyist, I can't advocate beyond appearing in an educational program like this. So until it's adopted by the ABA? We, we won't be actively pursuing it, but I think it's a long-term, I, I will say it's a long-term agenda, Ken, in that, um, you know, Congress isn't going to be rushing into considering lobbying legislation this session. It's going to take something else, uh, you know, whether it's a, the next scandal or working up to the next election, uh, that uh, members will look around for, we need to do something about this, what can we do? And I think all of us probably have the same thoughts of we should have some tried and tested language and exposed uh, concepts uh, ready to go when that time occurs. Uh, and uh, so th that, that's, the, that's the optimistic perspective. I would, I would add one, um, one thing, and that is that Representative Quigley in the last Congress introduced a bill called the Transparency in Government Act. And uh, that was a broad sort of sweeping transparency bill. And in it was, were provisions on lobbyist disclosure. Uh, it, didn't, it wasn't as comprehensive, certainly, as Sunlight would have liked, although it did include some contact information. Um, being disclosed and a few other changes to lobbyist disclosures. I believe Congressman Quigley is going to introduce that bill again. Um, but certainly I think I would agree with Tom. I think that this needs to be um, an opportunity to educate members of Congress on what can be done, what needs to be done, and kind of build the knowledge that way. I, I would just add that in uh, your resource sheets, there is a link to a page that has all of the lobbying reform related bills that were introduced in the last Congress. The only comprehensive one was TGA, uh, Transparency in Government Act, although there were a couple of small fixes uh, in there as well. And if you just follow the link, you can find out about that. Um, Want to go over this side? OK. Sir? Yeah, thanks. Just, 
just a comment first. Uh, all of the big points being talked about here today, enforcement, coverage of the lobbying support type people, issues like that, greater disclosure of contacts, there's really nothing new conceptually with all of these have been raised a number of times in the past first. And they haven't generally been dealt with for a range of reasons. Second, I would think as a longtime lobbyist who's been in lobbying for 30 something years and who has been outspoken many times on the need for lobbying reform, I can tell you that there are many lobbyists in town who do in fact support indeed greater reforms than say Sunlight or certainly greater than, greater than the ABA. Uh, as a longtime lobbyist with, who has made countless contacts, um, I'm a little troubled uh, by having to, the thought of having to report every time I talk to someone. Um, you know, it is a burden. If I'm doing my job, believe me, I'm talking to everybody on the bloody committee that's dealing with it anyway. Uh, I think you folks uh, from the press and sunlight may be putting a little more emphasis on that than it's worth. The big things that are talked about here are the broader coverage of people, the greater enforcement, and the need to separate campaign finance from the lobbying process. Um, I just want to re respond quickly in terms of coverage. I mean, maybe we disagree on the, the degree of, of uh, contacts that should be reported. Um, the lobbying law, though, right now says that I, as a lobbyist, have to report whether I met with the House, the Senate, or the executive branch. To me, that's meaningless. And I believe to Dan that's relatively meaningless. Um, so to say what office I met with or what committee I met with, um, I don't think is that much more of a burden. And I do think it would add a lot to the understanding. And it's been done. Um, there's uh, you know, a law in Canada that requires contacts to be reported. There's a San Francisco reporting regime. I mean, these are not um, you know, across the country. But I do think that you know, that would is a, an amount of detail that I don't think is that difficult to no, come I, by. I agree, I agree with you if it's simply me saying that I'm contacting all of the people, I'm happy to list their names. But if it means me having to go back in and list every time I'm dealing with that particular office of their LA, that gives me more concern. Well, again, I think another proposal of Sunlights that differs from certainly the ABA is we do, and you'll, you'll disagree with this, but we do um, encourage real-time reporting of meetings um, or as near to real-time as possible. Now, that being said, I agree with you. If it's one continuous conversation that I keep going back and forth with uh, you know, one staffer on one issue, then that is unrealistic. I would completely agree to have to report that same conversation every single time that, you know, that, I, that I have a well, what about this? Well, I think you should do, you know, X, Y, and Z. So I do think that there, you know, there has to be lines. We want to be reasonable. I don't want to have to report, you know, every time I send an email either. But, um, but to just say that every quarter, you know, even if I have to list who I've met with, I think that misses the point that we were talking about in that this really is an effort to improve the dialogue. So if a quarter goes by and I don't know who Paul's been talking to, and then all of a sudden I see, oh, maybe he's been talking to folks on you know, the Government Reform Committee, um, you know, maybe it's too late. And maybe I can't get my message heard in, as, in real time and in the amount of time that it needs to be meaningful. Can I add to that? Again, it's not my job to help you do your job. I'm a lobbyist. I have a strategy. I'm meeting with people, as, as Wright pointed out. I'm meeting, if I'm doing my job correctly, I'm meeting with everybody on the committee. It's not my job to do your job for you. So if you want to track who I'm meeting with just so that you can go in behind me um, and do this, that's not, what, that's not what this transparency system is for. It's not to help you do your job. It's to help people see who we're meeting with. So now we're taking it to a whole new level. You now want me to be responsible for you doing your job. If we're going to do that, can I invoice you and get a, get a piece of the paycheck at the end of the month? I'd be happy to do that. I mean, it's about trust in government, and it is about the integrity of the process, and I think that is why 
Uh, but me we do need it, more realistic But me disclosure. doing your job as far as telling you who I met with so that you can go in after me to, to send your message, that's not transparency. I mean, I that's think, me doing your job. But I think part of the problem that the public has with this institution and with this profession is that they think that there are these backroom meetings going on behind closed doors. I'm not but, asking but you to do my you're, job. What I'm you're saying skewing is the argument now. You're I'm saying, saying, you're saying the, the general public now wants to know who I'm tracking. Okay, as, as Wright said, if you want me to, if you want as the click down bar goes, you can put Veterans Affairs Committee, I'm happy to click that. But what you're now saying is the general public wants to know that I'm meeting with Scott Scott Peterson and XYZ committee um, at 3 o'clock p.m. and this is the issue discussed. No, that's no. what you I mean, want that's me not to actually, do. If well, you, you're if asking you, me to, to, to do your job and ask you to, uh, to who I'm meeting with. If you looked at the, the example that we used, it didn't say the name of the staffer. It didn't say what time the meeting took place, although that would sort of be implied, I guess, by when it was sent. Um, so no, I, I mean, I think you're reading too much into so, it. But so, I think that the integrity of the institution requires that more of this is out there so that people don't perceive lobbyists as making all these backroom secret meetings. Lisa, how do we treat written communications? Well, we can't have... And phone calls, because, I mean, that, you know, by and large, I mean, I hate to say it, but given uh, the dynamics of Capitol Hill and security and, uh, and the wonders of uh, uh, electronic communications, you, know, you can cover a lot more territory with uh, emails and a telephone uh, than you can with shoe leather. Real-time reporting? I mean, again, I think it, that's a, it's a fair question. We can't, though, create a loophole as we're doing this. So I'm not going to say it can only be face-to-face -face communications, because then, obviously, that will sweep that much more into electronic communications. So they do somehow, those types of communications have to be covered. Again, you know, if it's an initial contact that's saying, hey, what do you think about LDA reforms? And there's 27 emails back and forth between the staffer and, and the lobbyist on that. No, I don't think all 27 emails need to be reported. Do I think that initial email needs to be reported, that initial contact? And so when we, yeah. when we then uh, would send out a, uh, a communication to the Senate on appropriations matters to all 100 senators, I mean, I think the law can, and I think the ABA actually, in your own proposal, you have a way to. No, carve no, but we do. The, well, the, we do, the ABA doesn't require the contact sweeping. reporting. That was what I, I raised that as a, as a subject that was not included in the final. Well, it doesn't, I mean, regardless, I think there's ways to carve out. If you reach, you know, file, I've reached well, out carve to out. Wait a member. second. Wait, wait a, a second. Oh. Here we go. Here we go. No, if you're We're not reaching carving out, out. To, you could make a, an ex, a, a filing requirement, you know, that says every member of the Senate Finance Committee, every member of Congress, every Democratic member. I mean, I think there's ways to And how to helpful, it, uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely you can. But how helpful then is that with you? Because as Wright said, any good lobbyist is going to cover every member of the Finance Committee before an important matter comes out. So let me turn around and ask these guys, how helpful is that? How helpful is it to know um, that someone's been meeting with every member of a particular committee, for example, or that they just sent out a communique to every member of the Senate, you know, everyone who's working on a particular issue. You want to, yeah. Uh, well, first, I, that actually is helpful um, the, in the sense that uh, it shows, obviously, the importance of a given issue to, to a given lobbying group and that sort of thing. And actually, the other thing that often reveals, uh, you know, you, you, you find this out when you, when you report out a story like this on a committee level or something, um, a lot of times it's also telling who they don't meet with and who they don't contact. Sometimes it's partisan. Sometimes it's they're just dealing with the Republicans or they're just dealing with the Democrats. Um, so, so actually, that 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 is has some value. I don't know if it's worth the the trade-off. I mean, that that's a policy debate, but uh, there is actually some um, benefit to that. I'd I'd like. To, well, actually, I should let Sheila deal with this first, and then I'll come back with it. I, I'm very interested in the campaign finance point uh, that the questioner made, and I think it's really a an interesting. Yeah, I would just add, also from our perspective, again, since we're interested in identifying, measuring to some degree, the relative uh, clout of one interest compared to another, it's useful to be able to sh see a demonstrable relationship. This client uh, and or their representation met with that member of, or that chairman or ranking member of that committee. And it, uh, it so it, it demonstrates a relationship and it demonstrates uh, the relative clout of a particular interest. And the frequency with which an, an entity is meeting with, or lobbyist is in meeting with um, members of Congress demonstrates the money that they're putting behind it. We don't have any way of knowing how much uh, 
you know, Patton Boggs is, is spending on a particular issue relative to any others. So, but if you're concerned about. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to know, well, how much is Pfizer putting behind healthcare reform, uh, you'd be able to then see how often their representation is listing, a meeting with a chairman of a committee that has jurisdiction over that issue, or how many, how often they're listing that issue as their, uh, the topic that they're can, pursuing. Can I play devil's advocate on that one? Um, what happens, again, if it's, if the onus is on me to do this and say I want to be the next Jack Abramoff, I want to be the super lobbyist in, t in Washington for however long that lasts, I want to build my client list and, and get some new clients and, and make millions, I just write on there, I met with every chairman, every uh, chief of staff, um, to help bolster my claim, claim that I'm the best in this town, that I have the, the access that needs, is needed to represent people. That's not an accurate reporting. And who are you going to believe? It's my word against theirs. If they're not reporting, I mean, who's to say I didn't do it? So you would just, your point is that people will lie? There could be. I mean, look at when, when you talk about the top 25 report in a roll call every year of who's making the most money at the firms and how much they jump. I'd venture to guess if you went through those reports and there's some, there has probably been some misleading accountability accounts in there as to bolstering the, the dollar figures in there to, to make you the top 25. And, and that gets back to a question of enforcement. I mean, okay, I, I, again, I just, I just playing devil's advocate to her yeah, question. I think people can lie now and we just have less, much, much less information. So, uh, I agree with the comment earlier that to know that somebody lobbied the House or the Senate is virtually worthless. And so it's, it's trying to measure for the average citizen how much is, are these powerful moneyed interests uh, players and, and pushing on a particular issue so that they can then gauge how much the Congress is passing legislation or halting legislation based on the merits and not based on those uh, interests and, and their, their relationships with them. So, Dan, did you want to weigh back in? Uh, yeah, the, the campaign finance issue is interesting to me, not, not so much, not for, well, it's interesting to me for the predictable reasons that, uh, the, the, you know, the way that, that that plays out in this town, the way that you uh, uh, gain influence and, 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 and prestige by raising money for members and all that sort of thing. But what I find most interesting was, uh, was reflected in the question, which is that the dirty little secret is that a lot of lobbyists just hate it and would gladly never have to do another fundraiser again. Um, and, and so I'm very intrigued by the ABA idea because I think basically that gives everyone an out is my reading of that. That if you, uh, if you are, I mean, as a lobbyist, if you're, if you're the type of lobbyist who to some extent is basically being pressured into the system, into the having to show up and sign the checks and all that, you can say, you know, look, I, I got to be able to do my job, so I can't, you know, raise money for you, or I can't. Is that kind of the intent, or can you talk a little about that yeah, but, idea? Yeah, uh, I'd love to, uh, because, I mean, as a predicate to that, uh, when we first, when the task force first got together, there was a thinking, well, this is lawyers, this is the American Bar Association, we really don't need to sort of think about too broadly. Lawyers have codes of ethics, and they're enforceable. We lose our license. And so what about doing something that just applies to lawyers and makes it an ethical violation for lawyers to pay to play through uh, mixing lobbying and campaign finance? And, of course, the answer to that was, whoa, that, that'll put Paul Miller at a tremendous advantage to us because he's not a lawyer and working with a lobbying firm. Okay. Uh, I then approached uh, ALL uh, uh, when they were revising the Code of Ethics, and I talked to the board, and I said, how about you guys considering uh, addressing this issue uh, as part of the Code? Well, nobody, I mean, we'd have a lot of people dropping out of the American League of Law. It'd be an un, uneven playing field. Non-members would be able to give money. And so I, I, I hear this echo throughout uh, that I think probably most of the professional lobbyists uh, in the room would say, would agree. I mean, they're interested because, they, you know, we're interested in the betterment of the profession or you wouldn't be here, right? Uh, say, you know, uh, as long as it's a level playing field. Uh, and all lobbyists are equally situated, uh, then uh, we would love not to be uh, criticized and vilified by day and have a members uh, uh, or fundraisers' hands in our pockets for breakfast and nighttime. Uh, and so having that as a, across the board, now, you know, that would require legislation and 
Congress is not likely to be enthusiastic about removing that lucrative a source of fundraising uh, from uh, uh, the system. Uh, and, and that's a problem because I mean, look, there, are, there are some reasons that people give money and raise money that don't relate to uh, substantive objectives in your lobbying. I mean, a friend who's running for Congress, you know, or a friend who's in Congress, just a personal, I don't ever do business with him, but, you know, I'll, 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 I would write a check. Uh, I, I don't now that I'm working for a nonprofit, but I mean, I, I, you know, a little token of my personal affection. Or, you know, Paul would come to me and say, I, I need you to, you know, I'm, I'm going to a fundraiser. This is a subject that we, I know you believe in, an education thing. I'd send a check with him, and then, of course, I'd call him back. I'd, that's no commitment. I'm not looking for any objective for me. I'm doing it as a favor as part of the lobbying community. But that's a small amount. That's very teeny. What most of it is is you're looking for something, um, you know, support of your industry because you know the member has helped or you wanted to help. Uh, access. I mean, you know, it's not vote. People say, oh, it's not vote buying. Of course, it's not vote buying. But uh, when you are influential in keeping a member in office by raising substantial funds, uh, it's worth something. To that member, and uh, you know, I've I've spoken and written from time to time about the, you know, uh, the the very basic principle of reciprocity, is that when you've done an important favor for a member of Congress, there, it's 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 hardwired to respond to that favorably in some way. And I, I would agree to a lot of what Tom says, but what what happens in a situation where you have somebody? Again, spends five hundred dollars in a two-year cycle on a member because they want, they do want that person back because they are so supportive of say small business issues. Um, they're not necessarily working on anything for, for them in particular, but they spend five hundred dollars now. Is that a quid pro quo because they want that person to stay right. there? I mean, it shouldn't be. Can't, in my opinion, campaign contributions shouldn't be vilified. Yes, again, I will agree with both of you that there is a lot of things that probably need to be changed. And, and, and the question becomes, how do you do that so you don't make it so difficult for the average person like myself to be able to support somebody? Well, who Paul, distinguish between campaign contributions and fundraising activities, uh, being a campaign treasurer or chair. Uh, uh, hosting uh, or uh, uh, supporting fundraising events, uh, bundling of many different sorts. Now, those are all activities that go beyond the individual contribution. Uh, is that something that you could feel comfortable saying that it's wrong for lobbyists the, to do the if they're going to lobby? The treasurer thing I do. I think if you're a lobbyist, you shouldn't be a treasurer or running any member of Congress's PAC. I just don't think you should be in the business of doing that because the lines do get skewed. I do believe, though, I, again, I do, if, if say one of my clients who's a small business association says, we would like to have an industry breakfast, would you organize it and would you host it? I don't see anything wrong with that, putting my name on an invite and asking members of that industry to support this member of Congress because he or she has been so supportive of the issues that they are important to them. Not necessarily that they're asking her, him or her to do something sp specific, but again, we want to keep people here who are supportive of our issues. <coughs> Otherwise, if I get the other guy or other woman, I'm not going to be any better off, and I might as well close up shopping and, and move into a different profession because it's just going to make my job harder. Well, of course, if this were a direct gift to the person because you were really not quid pro quo, you were just pleased with the work that they did to support small businesses, and you wanted them to have your $500, that would be an illegal gratuity because it would be given by virtue of their, their position. But then uh, you may as well go arrest everybody in America who's given a campaign contribution. Well, we're not going to arrest anybody. We're going to try to draft. We're going to try to craft rules, which separate fundraising from lobbying. So, in in with that, I think we'll take one more question from the audience, uh, and then we're going to end. And <laughs> actually, uh, in the back there. Yes, you. Okay. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. I'm Meredith McGeehee. I was glad to hear that people touched on the campaign finance issue and, and the contact reporting issue. And I was uh, pleased to be able to participate in the ABA 
uh, exercise and think I would really highly recommend everybody take a look. Not everybody agreed on everything, but it's some very interesting proposals and well put together. And uh, my question actually was touched on by Dan, and I, I really, I struggle with this because I've been working on lobby reform for so long. And that is, uh, we struggle so much in terms of, you know, who is a lobbyist and defining that and getting to the report and as a one person shop, how you don't have too much burden. And I find myself and Sheila and I have had this conversation thinking maybe we do have this flipped the wrong way. That rather than all these individuals out here trying to report, why aren't the public officials themselves doing these reports? If they meet with someone who's a registered lobbyist, that should be on the database of registered lobbyists. They have a unique identifier. You know who that is. We all know if you go to the executive branch and you try and have a meeting in the executive branch, these days, by the time you give your social security number and half the information just to get in the door and your ID, there's not really a question of saying this is burdensome. They already have everything in the world practically about you. Um, so my question back to you is, should we really take a step back and think that the reporting should not be by the lobbyist, but by the government official who was receiving that? And that way, you have a better chance of having efficacious enforcement, and you have a better chance of having accurate information because there's more accountability there. Just an idea that I think is I'd like to hear people talk about. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, w I would say no. I'd rather have some more reporting requirements myself than force them to do it because what you're going to do, in my opinion, you're going to close them off and they're not going to meet with us. And then, again, if I have to go and give them my Social Security number, date of birth, and all this other stuff, it's going to take forever for me to get a meeting. If I just want to do a drop by, I can't do that because then I got to go through this reporting requirement to get through the database to see if I'm okay and I'm, I'm not somebody who's going to blow up the building or something like that. Um, I'd rather take a few more, have a few more burden or some steps on myself versus to do it to them. I just don't think it's going to be effective and we're going to close off the process. That's just my two cents. I, you know, I think members won't do that to themselves because the likelihood of some even uh, uh, unintentional, unintended error that could get a member in trouble if you wind up, you know, if you, if you walk in the door, you have to scan your lobbyist ID number, but if you catch them in the hall, you didn't. And so later the lobbyist is going to come out that the lobbyist met with so-and-so because we may have to report that or not. The member hasn't reported it. Whoops. I mean, they don't, you know, that's just, a, I think, going to be viewed by members as a trap for them. And I think Paul's point that um, it will um, chill uh, exchanges. I mean, I, you know, lobbyist discussions with members isn't a bad thing. Uh, I don't think. So I'm not real enthusiastic about making members uh, uncertain about whether they should talk to you. I mean, that, that's really what it sort of amounts to. Sheila? I was just going to say, I think it is a, as fluid and, and uh, easy as you could make it, leveraging technology to make it instantaneous, I think it would be, it, it's, a, it's a higher hurdle because they're going to, use the burden as, as, as I think we've already heard from some public officials, uh, use that as an excuse to not even go. So it's, it's a high bar to, to get them to act on it, but it's a higher bar if they view it as too burdensome, a burden that they are adopting for themselves. Speaking of bars, you know, just some, some legis state legislatures require lobbyists to wear identification tags. Seems to me if we all had a barcode with our ID on it, that way the member would only have to have a little portable scanner. So never, never mind. So uh, anyway, so uh, do you want to have the last word on this? In that case, uh, I'd like to thank. Um, um, we can. Oh, you want to say something? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to chime in at the last minute here. Sorry. Uh, I'm Robin from Congressman Quigley's office, and I just felt like it would be appropriate for me to say uh, my boss introduced the TGA last, last Congress, uh, and we're getting ready to drop a lobbyist disclosure enhancement bill this Congress next month. Um, it has a lot of the same ideas that TGA had that we have sunlight to thank for, um, and I'm excited to read the task force's report to see if maybe we've missed anything. I think they're really common sense things, um, 
um, we're not, our goal is not to limit access at all. It's just to increase transparency. Just make sure everything is out in the open. Um, and I think Lisa touched on this. My boss feels like there's been sort of a crisis of confidence. I mean, polling numbers amongst members of Congress are at an all-time low. So anything we can do to make the public um, try to increase you know, that confidence that we are being open, we are being honest with them, that's our objective. So if anybody wants to chat about it or follow up or, or whatever, again, I'm Robin with Mr. Quigley, and I'd be happy to, to talk to you guys about it. So thanks. Thank you. And we'd like to thank Mr. Quigley's office and Mr. Issa, Mr. Issa's office. That's not so easy to get uh, wrong. It's actually not a good thing to get wrong. Anyway, we'd like to thank them both for making this room available. They are a pleasure to work with, as always. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for joining us here today to talk about this very important issue. Uh, the next Advisory Committee on Transparency event will be on April 14th. It will be on the future of CRS. The head of the Congressional Research Service is stepping down, and we'll be discussing what happens next with them. Uh, thank you to our panelists again, and thank you all for coming.